Um, inflation is about to hit home with a 33 percent increase in fuel and energy prices this winter. Nearly half of Americans could see a spike of heating costs this very soon, like this month. Well, in colder climates, energy bills are going to be even higher. Brody Carter breaks it all down for us and brings us some tips to cut costs. It all comes down to how you heat your home this winter and where your home is. Recent U.S. energy stats indicate you might want to add your heating bill to the long list of higher priced items getting pushed by inflation and the war in Ukraine. Our forecast for those expenditures includes the National Oceanic and Atmospherics forecast for what they expect to be a slightly colder winter than last year. Because of that, we expect households to consume a little bit more energy to keep their homes warm. The largest increase is likely to be felt through the Midwest, where residents can expect a 33 percent cost increase to keep warm this winter. Nearly half of U.S. households could see an increase of 28 percent. Close to 50 percent of households use natural gas, so that's the primary fuel. And that's going up from an average of about 700 to about $950. But again, it depends where you live. In the colder states, it'll be even higher. The outlook is that natural gas users will see about a 28% increase, heating oil users 27%. If you have electric heating, that increase should be closer to 10%. And propane homes, 5%. Now remember, those numbers could change each month depending on the market and how cold it gets. Very concerned about elderly families that are living on fixed income, maybe only Social Security. While we know Social Security is going up by, I think, close to 9 percent this year, that won't be enough for families living in colder climates. Mark Wolf works with congressional leaders to help low-income families pay their bills. He says families making under $45,000 a year can tap into government supplemental assistance and that everyone can learn to cut costs. So if you can turn down your thermostat by, say, 5 degrees at night, that can save you up to 10 percent of your bill. Get your furnace tuned up. Get the furnace filters replaced. Go around the house with a caulking gun. Look where there are leaks and fill those leaks. And if you don't think you can afford the bill this year, and many people won't be able to, apply for help from a low-income home energy assistance program. There is a silver lining for residents with gas-powered furnaces. Although costs will go up, your bill is still expected to be about 30 percent less than those with electric furnaces or heat pumps. That's because heating with electricity is more expensive than gas, and heat pumps are less efficient in colder climates. Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, get ready for higher prices to hit you right, right at home. We have resources available online where you can sign up for help with your bill. You can also track energy prices by just going to CBNNews.com. In other news, Elon Musk has officially taken control of Twitter, and he quickly made his presence known. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That is right, Gordon Musk, who's now dubbed himself the new chief twit, fired four top executives, according to news reports, among them Twitter's CEO, chief financial officer, and top lawyer. The personnel moves were widely expected, along with likely more changes. Musk tweeted, the bird is freed, referencing Twitter's Bluebird logo. Critics have long complained of a Twitter bias banning conservatives. With Musk in charge, they hope free speech can be restored to the platform. Musk also tweeted, the reason I acquired Twitter is because it is important to the future of civilization to have a common digital town square where a wide range of beliefs can be debated in a healthy manner without resorting to violence. He also said Twitter should be a, quote, warm and welcoming a place uh, for all and the most respected advertising platform in the world. Well, new research shows a troubling trend concerning the church in America, revealing confidence in Christian leaders has been declining in recent years, sparked in part by reports of abuse, immorality, and other scandals. CBN Charlene Aaron shares how one pastor sees the need for a new generation of leaders that lives according to requirements laid out in Scripture. This has words for us about leadership, as does Paul, as does Peter, as does the epistle to Hebrews. So the New Testament, and going back to the Old Testament as well, God has not left us without a vision for what leadership should look like in the local church. In his new book, Workers for Your Joy, The Call of Christ on Christian Leaders, pastor and seminary professor David Mathis emphasizes how that call must be viewed through the lens of Scripture, the embracing a priority of servitude. It comes from the Apostle Paul at the end of his first chapter in his second letter to the Corinthians, where he says, we don't lord it over your faith, 
but we work with you for your joy. And if Paul, who was an apostle and one of the official spokesman for the risen Christ who wrote scripture could say that he didn't lord over his leadership over the Corinthians, but he worked with them for their joy. How much more so pastors in the local church that we would have a vision that why we are leading is for the sake of the joy of our people in Jesus Christ. On CBN's Prayer Link, Mathis says his book specifically follows the recent rise and fall of various church leaders and points out what possibly led them astray. You will find in one rise and fall story after another, some clear brooch mm -hmm. of uh, attribute and virtue that has been laid out by Christ and his apostles two millennia ago in the New Testament. So that list in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1, is significant. Paul means it. The apostles mean it. And there is wisdom in that list for healthy, normal leaders in the church today. The qualifications in the First Timothy list includes being blameless, sober, and of good behavior. Mathis adds the ability to teach is also key. When we think of ability, we might think of, oh, does this mean world-class oratory or great gifting? You know, is he an entertainer? Is he a gifted communicator? I don't think that's what's meant. What's meant is ability in the context, and it's a man who wants to teach. The pastors and elders should be those who want to feed the flock, like Jesus said, to feed his sheep, and to do that through teaching the Bible. It can be very simple. Simple. A simplicity, Mathis says, is needed now more than ever. Christianity is a teaching movement. Jesus was the consummate teacher in a day, frankly, where people can bristle at teaching. Oh, they want pastors to do just about anything other than teach. Do this, do that, care for us, listen to us, counsel us, very important things. But sometimes there is a kind of pressure in the pastoral ministry to not teach. And that is the central qualification and calling of local church pastors in the New Testament. While Mathis challenges aspiring and seasoned leaders to faithfully embrace the call of Christ, he also encourages those in their congregations to consistently pray for them. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Some good reminders. Thanks, Charlene. Well, earlier this month, Christian believers and Jews around the world came together to follow a biblical command. As CBN's Chris Mitchell reports, it centers around praying for Jerusalem. Shalom and welcome everybody to Jerusalem, Israel. This celebration marks the latest International Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem. Since 2004, this event has joined millions of Christian and Jews around the world to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. To fulfill the biblical mandate of Psalm 122.6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, recognizing that peace in Jerusalem signifies peace for the world. And so the day of prayer gathers and empowers Christians around the world to stand in alliance with that promise of God in Psalm 122.6. Bishop Robert Stearns helped start this effort and says Jerusalem is central to God's plan for the world. Jerusalem is a plumb line. Jerusalem is a, is a place of covenantal alignment. As goes Jerusalem, as goes Israel, so goes much of our world. And so when we focus in in this moment that is both filled with difficulty and promise, let's look at this. We have increased negative attacking rhetoric from Iran, from Syria. We've got all kinds of problems there. But through the Abraham Accords, we have amazing new opportunities for peace. So we have to pray that humanity moves in the direction of peace that has been promised to this land and to this region. The day brings Jews and Christians together. The International Day for prayer, of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem is a very important day in the calendar. It codifies the blessing and command to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, what Eagle's Wings has done by adding another holiday into the Christian calendar is really unbelievable. And here in Jerusalem, we celebrate it together with our Christian brothers. Stern says a younger generation is catching the vision of the importance to pray for Jerusalem. Being a younger man myself, uh, I'm just excited to help inspire others to come and see what is happening here in Israel, to not only come and view it, but take an active role in it. We're here to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We want to loudly and proudly tell the world that we want to stand with Israel. We want to stand with God in seeing the peace come about here in the land. It's important that the church and the nations wake up to the fact that God called them in the scriptures to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
Uh, he didn't say that about any other city. Prayer leader Rick Riding says given these perilous times, it's important to stand with Israel. It's always intense here, but right now with the threats, very existential threats coming from Iran and the relationships that seem to be developing more strongly between Iran and Russia, there's a real serious need for prayer for the peace of Jerusalem and of Israel. Writing says this also sends a strong message to the Jewish people that they are not alone. I was just talking to a Jewish man here and he said, I had no idea there were 150 million Christians in China and that many of them are praying for Israel. This is phenomenal. And so it also is helping the people of Israel to realize when they feel so rejected in the media that there are people who love them and stand with them. And it really gives a lot of courage to the people of Israel to hear about this prayer from all over the world for them. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the day of prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. Thanks, Chris. Following the biblical admonition to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Gordon, that's a story I doubt you'll see anywhere else. I doubt it, too. But part of the prayer for the peace of Jerusalem is also for the, uh, the prayer for the return of the Messiah. Will there ever be pre peace there until the Prince of Peace comes? So I encourage everyone everywhere, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It, it, it is the capstone. This is the place where God has said, my, this is my city, this is where my presence will be. Next month, the United Nations holds its annual climate summit in Egypt. World leaders will be pushing a green energy agenda and keeping fossil fuels out of third world countries while well, it's actually condemning millions of people to remain in poverty. It's the biggest roadblock to developing nations around the world. Dale Hurd has the details. A regular event at UN climate summits is a special presentation by indigenous groups of representatives from the developing world warning that climate change is a threat to their way of life. The world leaders have to be more aggressive and rapidly uh, keep fossil fuels in the ground. That's bottom line. Talk to leaders from the developing world, however, and you hear a different concern how being forced to use green energy will make it even harder for millions to escape poverty. Uganda's president wrote in the Wall Street Journal that Africa can't sacrifice its future prosperity for Western climate goals. Africa will have to use fossil fuels as it makes the transition. In Ghana, Peter Bismarck with the Institute for Liberty and Policy Innovation says what Africans need most is reliable energy not what he calls diversity, his term for green energy. Africans are not basically not interested in the diversity. They are much interested in the um, efficiency and the reliability of energy before they look at diversity. Vijay Jaraj of the CO2 coalition says it's the same situation in India. In a country like India, if you see there are more than 300 million people in poverty and uh, for them to come up in life, that has to be an overall economic development in the society. And that can happen only when uh, there is a robust energy sector. One critic said the idea that some of the poorest people on earth can suddenly switch to hydrogen based green technology is absurd. Remote areas of uh, within African countries are much interested in getting anything to light their refrigerators and charge their phones and watch television. Not only do wealthy nations want developing nations to switch to green energy, they're forcing the issue. The U.S., Britain and European nations have vowed to cut off public financing for new fossil fuel projects by the end of the year, including those in developing nations even as wealthy nations continue to use fossil fuels, including African natural gas. Magat Wade is director of the African Center for Prosperity. What's the difference between you, German, who when you need fossil fuels and you realize you still need it, you, you're going for it, yet you're telling me, the Africans, we can't do it. Is it because I'm black? Is it because we're idiots? Is it because we're inferior? We want to become prosperous nations. We want to become prosperous people. But for that to happen, Access to reliable and affordable energy is central, is key. The, the reality in developing countries is that the situation here is far worse than what is being portrayed in the media in the West. The countries here are already struggling to keep up with the energy demand. 
and uh, for them to experiment with green technologies would be not so wise uh, especially when uh, people are still living in the dark uh, hospitals are still uh, struggling to get a electricity connection and uh, when we live in poverty Sudanese British billionaire businessman Mo Ibrahim in a conference call this year with European Union leaders said that Europe's refusal to fund fossil fuels in Africa is morally indefensible. We found it, you know, a little bit strange when Europe is wallowing in gas, Russian gas, African gas, uh, putting gas projects everywhere. And uh, when it comes to Africa, no, 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 no. You are using African gas and you're denying us to use African gas. I mean, that is morally indefensible. The experts we talked to said they would welcome green energy if their nations could afford it and rely on it. But they can't. Forcing it on them now amounts to what some are calling green colonialism. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, this is a debate that's not going to be going away. It's not going to be going away anytime soon. I lived in Asia. I lived with energy insecurity where you, in any given day you had no assurance that you were actually going to be able to turn on the lights. Uh, and what would happen uh, when the power went out and, and how did you essentially structure your life around that? The problem with that is in the information age, you cannot build an economy if you can't keep these devices powered and, divide, and powered 24-7. The problem with green energy sources, whether it's wind or solar, solar, is that they're inconsistent. Solar stops when you have a cloudy day. If you're not having a windy day, you're not going to get wind energy. So th these are very pressing issues for these countries. And to say, we, well, we're denying you for the sake of the planet, uh, what we really need is some carbon capture technology to, to really come to the surface. How do we uh, stop the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at the same time giving countries the opportunity, and I'll underline, it's the opportunity to develop. They want to. They need a power grid to do it. Well, it's time to pray for America. You look at all the different struggles around the world. You look at the um, uh, div division right here in America, the, the political divide, uh, the number of threats to our security, to our peace, uh, to the world economy. Um, you can't help but look at it and throw up your hands and say, God, <laughs> we need you. Here's a warning from Jeremiah, and I hope you take it to heart, because when, when his judgment comes, it comes on both the righteous and the unrighteous. Uh, and as Christians, don't expect, well, uh, we'll, we'll have devastations, but it's going to happen somewhere else. We need to turn back to God, ask for his protection. Here's the warning. Give glory to the Lord your God before he causes darkness and before your feet stumble on the dark mountains. And while you're looking for light, he turns it into the shadow of death and makes it dense darkness. But if you will not hear it, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. Let's take this warning to heart why we can still see, why, why we can still, with our entire being, return to him. Let's do that. Let's return to God, and he will return to us. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you, and Lord, we ask again for forgiveness for our nation. We ask forgiveness for all the people. We ask forgiveness for our churches. And Lord, we ask forgiveness for us. We turn to you. We turn away from anything that we're doing wrong, anything we know is not of you. And we ask that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us and make us new again. Restore righteousness to our churches. Restore righteousness to us as people of God. Restore us, Lord God, so that we may serve you with clean hands and a pure heart. Do this, Lord. We can't do it on our own. Do this, Lord, for we need you now. 
In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to join with us as we pray for our country, we're in our final week. We end this uh, 40-day prayer for America next Thursday. You can call us, 1-800-700-7000, or go to PrayForAmerica.com. Let us know you'll be praying with us. Now, when you do, we'll send you a prayer flag and a Prayer for America bumper sticker. So call us at 1-800-700-7000 or go to PrayForAmerica.com. Terry? In 2013, Greg Kelly was a high school senior with a full-ride football scholarship and his whole life ahead of him. Then he was blindsided by a horrendous accusation, and soon he was facing 25 years in prison without parole for a crime he did not commit. Everything was stripped away from me in life. Yeah. Yeah, I'm mad at God. I'm, I'm, I'm mad at everybody. Greg Kelly is now waiting to be released. In a highly publicized trial, 18-year-old Greg Kelly, the Cedar Park, Texas football star on his way to a full scholarship, was found guilty of sexually assaulting two four-year-old boys, a crime he didn't commit. I remember the screaming, uh, how can this be happening? Uh, it, was a, it was a nightmare. It was a start of just a nightmare. Because his parents had medical issues and couldn't drive, Greg was staying at the home of his best friend and teammate, Jonathan McCarty, who lived across the street from Leander High School. The two 18-year-olds had an uncanny resemblance. However, Greg was the only one questioned and suspected of the abuse that took place in the daycare run in the McCarty home by Jonathan's mother. Greg's sentence, 25 years with no parole. I'm asking God, man, if, if you're real, step in right now. I need a savior. I can't do this by myself. Um, I'm crying out. Those who knew Greg couldn't fathom he was guilty. Other concerned citizens like Jay Bryden were convinced he got what he deserved until he became aware of a different point of view. Then I started seeing people on Facebook just comment about how wrong it was. And I had a guy call me and said, hey, man, have you heard about this Greg Kelly thing? And I said, man, I saw it last night. I just, he goes, dude, my daughter went to that trial every single day and he didn't do this. Jake spoke to many others who knew Greg. Soon he too was convinced a good man had been wrongly convicted and decided something had to be done. Two days after Greg's verdict, he brought hundreds to the county jail where Greg was being held. Complete strangers as well as people of the community were coming and rallying and, and, and just chanting, free GK, free GK. It made me feel really good to know that we're getting somewhere. Like, people are fighting for me. You know, I, there's, there's a reason to have hope now. Eventually taken to the state penitentiary in Huntsville, Texas, Greg would find even more reason to have hope. The Lord had my undivided attention now. That I was sitting there getting to know Him, didn't know Jesus, who he was and preparing me for the journey I'm about to face. And ultimately letting me know that I'm gonna be with you through it all. By now, Jake had hired a defense attorney, Keith Hampton, to look deeper into Greg's case. It didn't take long to see things weren't adding up. Meanwhile, thousands were praying for Greg. There was prayers of me being free and my name being cleared, there was prayers of me being able to get football back and play football. There was prayers of me getting my, my girlfriend back and marrying her. Not at the age of 45 when I would get out, but as a young man. Greg would spend the next three years in prison waiting for a retrial, relying on God to get him through each day. In that time, his attorney, Mr. Hampton, made some disturbing findings. A detective and prosecutor eager for a conviction a mishandled police investigation, and no due process. He took his findings and new evidence to the new district attorney, who agreed to reopen the case. On August 22nd, Mr. Hampton handed Greg a piece of paper saying Judge Donna King had ruled that his case would go to the Texas Appeals Court. And there was one other thing. Puts it against the glass. And I read it, and I just start breaking down. And it says, immediate release. And, man, it was, oh, wow, it was, um, it was such a surreal moment. It was like, 
I, 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 asked, I asked Keith, I was like, man, are you for real? Greg's fight for redemption wasn't over yet. Out on bond, he went home to his family where he had to wait for a decision from the appeals court. Yeah, I just knew that tomorrow I could get stripped away from everybody again and get thrown back into prison. In November 2019, six years after being found guilty, a now 24-year-old Greg Kelly appeared before Judge King. His conviction had been overturned, and he was declared innocent of all charges. It was one of the most wonderful moments I've ever had in my life. I'm young, and I got a lot of life left to live. As of today, no one has been charged for sexually abusing the two boys, including Greg's former friend and lookalike, Jonathan McCarty, who was later convicted of other sexual crimes. As far as Greg, he went on to play one season of college football at Eastern Michigan University. He married his high school sweetheart, Gabri, opened an axe throwing business, and is currently finishing up his business degree at the University of Texas in Austin. As tempting as it might be to hold bitterness against those who wronged him, Greg says he can only point to Jesus Christ. It's so crazy to say that prison is a place full of hate, but it's where I learned how to love. And the more that I got to understand Jesus and what he did for me, right? Bearing that cross, shedding his blood for me, for my sins, and to choose to live the very best life in his reflection that I can. And that, that means forgiveness. Boy, Greg's story is powerful, isn't it? I mean, it's hard to imagine going through what he went through without feeling bitter and resentful and angry, which I guess he did in the beginning. And maybe it's a microcosmic look at life for all of us because we have that choice. Things happen to us that are not fair. I mean, if you, if you had to have a bumper sticker that just kind of said most of it, it's life is not fair. But what are you gonna do with that? What are you gonna do with that reality? Because for him, it was a very big reality. And yet he made some choices that allowed him to move forward with his life, not to dwell on what had happened, but to look forward to, God, who are you and what do you want in my life? God's not so interested in our comfort as he is in our hearts. He wants us for all eternity. I don't know why things happen. You know, there have been books written about what, when bad things happen to good people. I don't understand why that happens. It just seems to be part of life. Unfairness seems to be part of life. But then we come down to the crux in the road, which is what are you going to do with the circumstance you find yourself in? He pushed toward God. He pushed toward Jesus. In the beginning, he admitted, I was angry with God. And anyone would have been. But he moved beyond that, and he received a relationship with God that he'd not had before, which colored all of how he saw life. And finally exonerated, it allowed him also to propel forward from that place. You know, we have that opportunity, every one of us, to have a, a do-over with Jesus in our lives. When we've made mistakes, he didn't even make a mistake, but when we do, God still offers us grace and mercy. What is it that holds us back? Lack of forgiveness, an unwillingness to let go of the unfair thing or things that were done to us. In Greg's situation, that was a pretty big deal to let go of that kind of unfairness. But when he did, he had a whole new future open up to him. I wanna say to you, if someone has hurt you today, harmed you in any way, done something unfair to you, Forgive so that you can be free. It's not claiming that everything that was done to you was, was okay in any capacity. It's saying, I'm not going to allow that to define who I am. Release the person or the people. Let go of the, the unfairness that was done and grab hold of the tomorrow that God has for you. You can start that today. If you're struggling with something in your life that you feel is really burdening you and holding you down, we want to send some information to you on forgiveness. It's called Forgiveness, God's Power in Your Life. You can have this for free. The phone call to get it is free as well. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I'd like that information on forgiveness. We will get it out to you right away. Gordon? 
Still ahead, Ashley Key takes us behind the scenes of the blockbuster series, The Chosen. She talks one-on-one -on -one with the actress who plays Mary Magdalene. That's coming up. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Has Jesus changed your life? We'd love to hear your story and celebrate it by sharing it with others. You never know how your story could change someone's life. Hello, everyone. I am so happy we are together for one of my most favorite times of the year, Thanksgiving Day. Gizmo and friends have so much to be thankful for. I'm thankful for my family, my friends. For God and all that he has created. We have resources to be able to live. And the Holy Spirit. Those are wonderful things to thank God for. Always be thankful to God for the things and the people in your life. Join the CBN Animation Club and get the great Thanksgiving turkey test. Plus two copies to share with others. All for your gift of only $25. This special holiday program features ways of showing thankfulness through games, activities. This is my first time going to be eating candy corn. And much more. President Abraham Lincoln declared a national day of Thanksgiving to be celebrated every November. The Great Thanksgiving Turkey Test, yours when you join the CBN Animation Club. The more we practice being thankful, the easier it is to be thankful for everything. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. The high school football coach who lost his job for praying on the field will be reinstated next year. ABC News reports court documents show that Coach Joe Kennedy will be restored to his position as an assistant coach at Bremerton High School in Washington State. The Supreme Court ruled 6-3 to three that the Constitution protected Kennedy's right to kneel and pray at the 50-yard line after games sometimes with his players. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is helping refugees fleeing the war in Ukraine, like Yana, a mother who was working in her garden when her daughter came running. She says about 20 Russian soldiers had broken into their home, and they threatened her life when she stood up to protect her children, but she refused to retreat. Instead, she questioned their idea of being a soldier after attacking a woman with children with their machine guns. The Russians backed down, and Yana could only credit a miracle from God for her family's safety. They immediately fled, and after a dangerous journey, arrived at the Lviv Theological Seminary. Operation Blessing provided them with food and supplies that they needed. A grateful Yana said without that help, they would be destitute, and that Operation Blessing support helped them to be able to hope for the best. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Sick and nearly starving, an out-of-work grandmother refused to eat so her granddaughter could have food. Then all the food ran out, and this desperate family had nowhere to turn for help. But now, thanks to you, their lives are like night and day. Life has been tough for 60-year-old Grandma Saban. She's a widow, raising her granddaughter alone. I am very poor. I wash dishes for events like weddings and funerals to earn a little money. Grandma told us there hasn't been enough income even to buy food for her granddaughter, Ling. After the pandemic hit, even the dishwashing jobs dried up. She said at one point she got sick and they nearly starved. When I was sick, I let my grandchild eat, but I didn't have anything to eat. I was malnourished. Lynn went to the neighbor and asked them for food. That's when CBN's Orphan's Promise helped the family in their desperate situation. First, we gave them emergency food packs. Then, to help Grandma earn extra money, we gave her what she needed to start a grocery business in her home. It's like night and day. I work at home selling groceries. No need to wash thousands of plates. I am so happy. Then to increase customers at the store, Orphan's Promise gave her a sugar cane press so she can make drinks to sell as well. 
I am so happy with the new income. My grandchild is also have enough to eat. She now is able to go study at the Athens Promise After School Program. Thank you so much for everything. All the food gone. I mean, what do you do when you come to that place at the end of the road? You know, there's so much hopelessness in the world. It's such a privilege to be able to walk into the midst of people's need with hope. You know, 700 Club members, that's the gift that God has given you, carrying the light to people around the world who are in difficult places, carrying the needs fulfilled just like this grandmother, but also carrying the light and the message of the love of God. You know, you are his presence in the midst of their need, and we say thank you to you for that. You're a 700 Club member for $20 a month. Some of you haven't joined yet, and I just want to ask you today to do that, to make that commitment. I know things are costing more for all of us, but for people who are in the same situation that Grandma Saban was in, and there are many, many of them, uh, their need has no answer unless we step up to the plate and step right into that opportunity. Will you do that today? Joining the 700 Club is so easy. It's a, a free phone call, 1-800-700-7000. You just say, I want to join the 700 Club. And then tell us what level you'd like to join at. A general membership is 65 cents a day, $20 a month. But you could join 700 Club Gold at $40 a month or become a 1,000 Club member. That is $84 a month. Our 2,500 Club members join us at $209 a month. Then we have a group called the Founders. They join us with a gift of $5,000 or more a year, and that works out to $417 a month. We have the privilege and the opportunity to truly make a difference in the lives of people who are in desperate situations. Will you call now? And when you do, our way of saying thank you for caring about other people is to send you Gordon's, Gordon's latest teaching. I love this. The Lord is my shepherd, breaking down that beautiful 23rd Psalm that is such a treasure to all of us. This will be a great blessing to you. And at the same time, you will have the satisfaction of knowing that you are truly touching lives. Mary of Magdala has been called one of the most misunderstood characters in the Bible. Recently, Ashley Key traveled to the set of The Chosen. She spoke with a actress Elizabeth Tabish about what it's like to play Mary Magdalene on the groundbreaking series. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. Hey everyone, it's Ashley here, and I have the amazing opportunity of speaking with one of the cast members of The Chosen, Liz Tabish. She plays uh, Mary of Magdalene, and I'm so blessed to be here with you today. I'm so glad you're here. Thank oh my you. Gosh. Okay, well, let's just get right into it. You obviously are playing a very profound role. Uh, as Mary of Magdalene, which I'm sure, again, you already know. Did you do, like, before you really started filming and just becoming a part of The Chosen, did you dig deep into, like, who Mary was? And if you did, did you find anything that actually, like, was surprising to you? I kind of went into this knowing a little bit, like, just culturally yeah. who Mary Magdalene mm -hmm. was, which turns out is is not at all yeah. <laughs> what is, like, biblically accurate. Yeah. There's this this... Yeah. I think confusion about yeah. who she is in the Bible because there's so many Marys. <laughs> I know there. Are, yes. <laughs> this Mary yeah, is yeah. a woman of ill repute. Is it? You know. It's so. When I first got the script, I had mm -hmm. no idea she had been possessed. Mm -hmm. Had no idea that mm -hmm. Jesus cast out demons from her. So I'm like, this is yeah very dramatic point in her life yeah. that's like a line in the Gospels and mm -hmm. like forgotten about. So yeah. uh, I'm grateful for the the writers to. to delve into that and, and go yeah. into a, a backstory to make that make sense. Well, let's talk about the ending of episode one of yeah. season one. Yeah. That scene, I think, is one of the most profound and powerful of all the seasons thus far. What was that scene like for you? <laughs> it was freezing. <laughs> we oh, were, it, freezing? it was so cold outside. I was so nervous to, mm. to get it right because yeah. it was, I think I, I did the thing that, that, young actors do, which is like put this pressure on ourselves to get it right. And I I just remember thinking like, if I don't do this right, it's so early, they could recast it or <laughs> like people won't like it or, you know, it, like it's the hook for the rest of the season mm. and then the rest of the series. Yeah. But you start thinking that and you get in your head and it's, yeah. it's over. So I just had to keep returning to the mm. present. You 
What's it been like working with Jonathan, who oh, he's obviously been, plays Jesus? Wonderful. But then Dallas, too, you know, as the director, as, like, the visionary, you know? He's so funny and easy to be around mm -hmm. and also very, very attuned with his actors and, like, mm -hmm. understands the nuance of not just what he needs for the scene, but how to get it out of us. Wow. Um, yeah. So if I'm stuck somewhere, he'll just, like, mention some little thing, kind of off topic or um, like remind me of a, a line from a previous scene that just unlocks mm. what he needs us to do. And Jonathan is uh, the sort of actor that y you absolutely need for, for, mm -hmm. for character of Jesus. Yeah. Which is, he doesn't take everything so seriously. So it's not this like very stoic thing, which I think people have done so yeah. much in, yes, the, in the past absolutely. and then in the moments that are sort of divine mm -hmm. is so focused on the present moment. I, I've heard from the producers that the end of the show has been plotted, has been written. Are you prepared for like how it's going to end? It, I, when I first booked that, that this, that's mm -hmm. what I thought of, of like yeah, the of ending. Course. Yeah. Uh, and that's, it's intimidating for to, sure to know that that's where it, goes. Mm. Um, even just thinking about the crucifixion, I sort of dread doing it because mm. at that point we'll have been filming for yeah. so many seasons yeah. and we'll have gone mm. through so much together Yeah, that it's going to be, it's just going to be hard, yeah, you know, sure. to emotionally, to, 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 which makes it easy to <laughs> act, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like emotionally for hard, sure. but like, as an actor, I'm like, oh, that'll just, yeah. I'll just look at everyone's faces and it'll be over. Can you believe we're really here for this? Yes. Down. Well, next month, the creators of The Chosen are doing something unique. They're releasing the first two episodes in theaters. Ticket sales for the season three theatrical release of The Chosen are available now. For information on how you can get them, go to cbnnews.com for a link. The first two episodes will premiere in theaters nationwide this coming month, November 18th. Well, time for some email. We've got you ready? Email. <laughs> okay. This first one comes from Matthew, who says today's world requires immediate results with the advancement of technology, and it feels as though our youth are more lost than ever before. How do you introduce Jesus into their lives and give them those immediate results that will help them believe? Matthew, let me give you a shameless plug for Superbook. Superbook is a free app. You can download it to any iPhone, any uh, Android phone, um, uh, Amazon Fire devices, any tablet. And in that, you'll have, again, for free, uh, episodes of stories from the Bible that engage children. Uh, we've uh, done, we've broadcast this around the world. The audience levels we're getting for Superbook are absolutely incredible. But within the app itself, you have the Bible, you have these devotionals, you have uh, how to how to how to know God. How can I be assured of my salvation? Uh, it's it's an amazing uh, device. In, in all the years of uh, CBN's history, it's absolutely become number one for us in, in, in producing salvations around the world. So I encourage you to get it. I encourage your children to watch it. Uh, you will absolutely see a change in them. This is Diana who says, I divorced my husband 25 years ago due to verbal and physical abuse. He's been verbally and emotionally abusive toward our three children who are adults now. They are wonderful parents and they've tried numerous times to have a relationship with their dad. The problem is he remains so verbally abusive towards them. Now he's started to abuse two of our granddaughters, telling them they're stupid and making fun of their looks. My question is, should my children continue to have a relationship with him even though he's so toxic, when is enough enough? Well, enough is enough when he's abusing your grandchildren. Um, they're children. They need protection. Uh, they should not be in an environment where there's uh, verbal, emotional, 
physical abuse. Uh, the, no child should ever have that. Uh, it leaves lasting issues. For your adult children, I certainly understand why they would want to have a relationship with their father. All children do. But they're adults, so they get to draw their own boundaries. And uh, you can encourage them. Um, they may even need some therapy to kind of see what's going on. Uh, to say, okay, why are these triggers are in my life and what is the behavioral result in me? Uh, but those are their decisions. Um, the, the absolute line in the sand is what's happening to your grandchildren. That should not be. Mm -hmm. This is Jan who says, when a Christian dies, who escorts them to heaven? I've read that an angel does this, but I have also read that Jesus will escort us home. Well, to be absent from the body is to be present from, with the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote. So uh, as soon as you leave your body, you're in his presence. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not all that into this. There's some kind of escort and you have to go to somewhere else. Uh, my view of heaven, it's a dimension right here. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is in your midst is what Jesus said. Uh, and then some translations say, the kingdom of heaven is within you. These things are kind of hard for us to understand because we keep thinking we'll have to journey to some far off land. Uh, when you get that it's right here with you, to be absent from the body is to now be present with the Lord. You're not going on some journey. Uh, you're being translated into another dimension. It's, a, it's another thing. Here's the great thing. We get to pray for heaven his will to be done on earth. And that is a wonderful prayer. We leave you with this word from Philippians. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus.